Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicle. The series of books and videos on American history is seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of William McKinley, and the focus is war. The year is 1898, and Congress has declared war against Spain over what was going on in Cuba at the request of President McKinley. This is the first military conflict for the United States with a foreign power in over half a century. The major had become the commander-in-chief, and one of the first things he had to do was to organize for war, and that meant a change in his cabinet. John Sherman, the Secretary of State, was clearly not in his element anymore. He had gotten on the older side, he no longer had the energy and the focus, and McKinley knew almost immediately when war was declared, he had to make a change. He asked for Sherman's resignation. Now, Sherman was disappointed. He had given up his Senate seat at McKinley's request to come into the cabinet, but eventually he acquiesced, and McKinley elevated the assistant secretary, his friend William Day, to move into the Secretary of State spot. Now, the only reason McKinley had any real uh, force of arms under him at this point to take on the Spanish was because of his predecessors and their act activity to modernize the Navy over the last decade and a half. Chester Arthur, Grover Cleveland, Benjamin Harrison had all been committed to modernizing the U.S. Navy to give William McKinley at this time of war four battleships of the first class, another one of the second class, and 48 other modern naval vessels, including cruisers, torpedo ships. Really, for the first time in American history, the United States would go into a military conflict with the advantage on the Navy side. As for the Army, not so much. American tradition had been against a large standing army, and that was still in effect here in the 1890s. So there were only a couple of thousand officers in the army at the time and about 26,000 enlisted men. So McKinley called for volunteers, 125,000. But then confusion reigned as they tried to mobilize for war, relocating in Tampa, Florida, where everyone was converging, and it was frankly chaos. The army was wholly unprepared for this. General Nelson Miles was in charge. McKinley also tapped 11 others to be major generals. They're trying to organize, but this was a logistical nightmare. So said one of the volunteers, a colonel who had put together his own regiment. This one happened to be the former assistant secretary of the Navy under McKinley. Theodore Roosevelt. He had quit that job to go back to Dakota, to the Badlands, to find his friend's former regiment. They called themselves the Rough Riders. They showed up in Tampa, and Roosevelt saw chaos. No words could describe to you the confusion and lack of system and the general mismanagement of affairs here, according to Roosevelt. And as things failed to improve, he later added the blunders and delays of the Ordnance Bureau surpassed belief. They express this stuff we don't need and send it the rifles by slow freight. There was no head, no energy, no intelligence in the War Department. They were still trying to figure this out, but the Navy was trying not to wait. They were ready to get started. The focus was the Spanish fleet, and that was in two locations, in Cuba and in the Philippines. In North America and in the Caribbean, you had an attack force under Com Commodore William Sampson, 24 ships at his disposal, all uh, mustering in Florida. Then there was this group called the Flying Squadron under Commodore Winfield Schley, just five ships, but their job was to defend the East Coast in case the Spanish fleet decided to try to attack. Well, while well, they're waiting for the army to get their act together, Sampson blockaded all the Cuban ports. He cut all the communication lines basically to try to isolate the island. And in the meantime, they laid their own cables to enable ship to shore communication. In fact, this would go all the way back to the White House where President McKinley had a war room set up. He was getting near real time information from the Navy in the Caribbean. But the first attack didn't take place there. It took place in the Philippines. Commodore George Dewey was ordered to take out the Spanish fleet in the Pacific. And this was one of the greatest naval victories in American history, rivaling what Oliver Perry had done at the Battle of Lake Erie in the War of 1812. It was Dewey arriving on April the 30th in Subic Bay with nine ships. Six of those were fighting vessels, 53 heavy guns, but the Spanish weren't there. They weren't in Subic Bay, so Dewey assumed they were 50 miles south in Manila Bay. So he took his fleet there, crept in at the time of darkness, evaded the mines that he thought would be there, showed up at dawn and found the seven Spanish ships in the Spanish fleet arranged in a crescent formation. This was a rout. Dewey had five passes in front of the Spanish. All their ships were sunk or destroyed or disabled within a few hours. The Spanish suffered 161 killed, 210 wounded. For the Americans, nobody died, nine wounded. The Americans didn't lose a single ship.
It took about a week before William McKinley got news from the Philippines and from uh, Commodore Dewey about this, and he simply said, the magnitude of this victory can hardly be measured by the ordinary standards of naval warfare. He immediately promoted Dewey to admiral. Next orders, he decided to send 20,000 American soldiers to help secure the island. According to McKinley, he was in addition to securing acquisition and control of the bay, the president directed the army to become an arm of occupation to the Philippines for the twofold purpose of completing the reduction of Spanish power in that quarter and of giving order and security to the islands while in the possession of the United States. Now, this was a pivotal decision. We'll have more about this in a future episode with significant implications, but for now, the U.S. West Coast was safe, and that was the key idea. There would be no worry from the Spanish fleet on any attacks on the U.S. West Coast, thanks to the magnificent naval victory of Commodore Dewey, now Admiral Dewey, and his Pacific fleet. Now, in the Caribbean, there had basically still been no movement, still scrambling to get ready, and President McKinley was losing patience. He wanted to crush the Spanish in Cuba before potentially any European support might come in on the side of the Spanish, and before the yellow fever season kicked in, which would put the American subject to that disease. The Spanish had consolidated their fleet within Santiago Harbor. And so Admiral Sampson blockaded that harbor, but he couldn't enter because he knew it was mined and that would be the destruction of his fleet. He needed the army to land, come around the other side of the city and force the issue. This was all wearing on President McKinley as he was waiting for this action to take place. Less than a month into the conflict, George uh, Cortelieu, his secretary, said, the president again is looking careworn, the color having faded from his cheeks and the rings being once more noticeable about his eyes. The strain upon him is terrible. And to wait another month before the army was finally ready, this is mid-June, they finally landed about 6,000 soldiers on the island of Cuba. Within a few days, that was up to 17,000 soldiers, and their goal was clear the heights over Santiago to Cuba. This is the second largest city in Cuba, and it was the one surrounding Santiago Harbor. The showdown eventually really took place on July 1st. And this was, again, the heights over Santiago to Cuba, where the Spanish were uh, in, in a line, and the Americans tried to soften that up with an artillery barrage, but it didn't do much good. Very minimal damage, and in the meantime, the Spanish were offering withering fire down that hill to the Americans, who were sort of unprotected. They were picking off Americans left and right, and the Americans knew they couldn't just sit there, they had to do something. And it, again, it was Theodore Roosevelt, among those, who were pushing for what he saw as the only alternative, a charge up that hill. Just take it with as fast as you can go and kick the Spanish out. He thought that was the only way, and that's what they agreed to do. Roosevelt and his Rough Riders went up Kettle Hill next to them, their colleagues going up San Juan Hill. Eventually, again, they were falling left and right because the firing was coming down upon them, but they did not stop, and they eventually blew through those entrenchments. They ousted the Spanish. The Spanish tried a counterattack later on that day, did not do any good. Within a few hours, the heights over Santiago de Cuba were in U.S. hands, and Santiago Harbor, where the, uh, where the Spanish fleet was, was essentially surrounded. Now, this didn't come without cost. The Americans lost 225 killed, 1,384 wounded in the battle at San Juan Heights, but largely across the United States, this was a cause for celebration, and it made Theodore Roosevelt a national hero. Now, they still had to assault the city, and they were figuring out how to do this when something else happened. The Spanish tried a breakout. They got orders to their fleet to try to get past the American blockade. It was a complete failure. This was on July 3rd. Five of the, Spanish, uh, five of the six Spanish ships were destroyed immediately. One got past the blockade, but frankly, the American uh, Navy uh, tracked that one down as well. Their captain shuttled that, uh, scuttled that ship, and Admiral Sampson was able to send in word that the fleet under my command offers the nation as a 4th of July present the whole of Cervera's fleet. Major victory again for the United States. Now, there was a couple other things going on at this same time. As these victories were occurring, recall from an earlier episode, the annexation of Hawaii was a treaty that McKinley had negotiated, but it was stuck in the United States Senate. There was a still sense of imperialism about this from some of the senators who weren't going to give that two-thirds approval. But as the war situation was going so well for the Americans, Speaker of the House Thomas Reed and others actually gave up their concerns. And this was a big victory for William McKinley. He had told Cordelou that we need Hawaii just as much and a good deal more than we did California. 
It is manifest destiny, according to McKinley. And now the Senate finally complied. Annexation of Hawaii took place July 7th of 1899. There were a couple other things going on that the Americans also wanted. They wanted the Spanish out of the Caribbean in its entirety. So they decided to land on Puerto Rico. They took that island without any difficulty. And frankly, the easiest one of all was back in the Pacific, where the American Navy took Guam, the island, really without a shot being fired. But the negotiations over Santiago de Cuba were still languishing. The Spanish weren't ready to simply give up, even though they were completely surrounded. And William McKinley was really getting frustrated about this, in part because soldiers were dying, the disease factor was kicking in on the island, and finally he issued an ultimatum. July 14th basically told the Spanish to stand down or prepare for an assault. Three days later, they capitulated. The city was now in the hands of the Americans. 22,000 Spanish soldiers had given up. Formal armistice took another, about another month, and this was negotiated with the French ambassador, Jules Cambon, who had been authorized as the representative of the Spanish. And again, this was all about what was the United States going to keep? What did the Spanish have to give up? As the, as the armistice had not actually been signed yet to bring hostilities to at least a temporary end pending final negotiations of a peace treaty. Well, the United States was adamant that the Spanish needed to get out of Cuba, out of Guam, out of Puerto Rico. The big question was the Philippines. What was the United States going to do with the Philippines? And as far as McKinley was concerned, he was going to leave that up to the negotiators who were going to meet in Paris for the final peace treaty. But the Spanish had to give in on the rest or else he was going to resume the fighting. Again, this took about a month, but eventually the Spanish agreed to the basics of this armistice deal as the Americans demanded. Cambon and William Day signed that armistice agreement in August the 12th and the Spanish-American War was over. This was a remarkable three months in American history. In an effort to quell an internal rebellion between the Cuban people and the Spanish, the United States looked at those as atrocities, decided to engage, asserted themselves as a dominant military power. They obliterated the Spanish on the land and on the sea, suffering only 300 killed in combat combined between the army and the navy. They had brought the entire Spanish fleet to its knees. The Spanish army had uh, capitulated. It really transformed the role of the United States in global affairs. They had won the war. Now they needed to win the peace, and that was going to be much more difficult than they thought. But that's the story for another day. That is William McKinley and war from the life of William McKinley. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.